Devlin? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Devlin Wing. I um, work with a company, Mequipco Limited. We are a Western-based uh, manufacturer's representative, and today I'm pleased to present to you uh, Rob Hacking from GE Water and Power. The um, first, thank you to the West Side Solutions Committee for inviting uh, us to present today and also be involved in uh, gathering information and sharing information with the public. It's something we take great pride in doing, and we know that there are many challenges for communities of all sizes. Rob brings some experience globally, nationally, and also locally when he's talking with GE Membranes. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. Hi, everyone. Devlin just stole the intro, so I'll skip straight to the, uh, the technical presentation here. Uh, on today's agenda, we have uh, a little bit of intro into GE Water. Uh, and maybe even more importantly, what regional presence we have here. Uh, some concepts and ideas of importance, um, the technologies behind those ideas, and then a, a summary, and uh, within that summary, a little bit of a look at, at some of the case studies or reference plants uh, that have demonstrated those technologies. Uh, so this is a little bit of a generic slide, but really the most important things here are the quick facts. Um, headquartered in the US, G Water, this is G Water and Process Technologies, um, headquartered in Trevos, Pennsylvania, uh, 8,000 employees uh, globally, uh, so sizable company, uh, 50,000 uh, customers in 150 countries, um, and a large number of manufacturing sites for quite a range of technologies. In municipal wastewater, um, we have our two sort of goals there of helping municipalities uh, deal with their, uh, with their limited resources and growing populations, while also trying to match uh, regulatory uh, change and policy change. Um, our solutions really in the municipal wastewater space are uh, membrane bioreactor uh, systems, which um, depending on how long uh, you've been around for in the wastewater industry, you might recognize the name of xenon uh, or zeweed membranes. That's the, uh, that's the solution we have today. Uh, primary treatment systems, um, and especially here in, in this community, uh, Solzness are, uh, are the technology, or, or what you'll see as representative of the technology today. And then an advanced anaerobic digestion uh, process, uh, which is uh, manufactured by a company called Monsel. Um, so GE uh, G has involvement with and, and directly owns xenon and, and Monsel. Um, our experience, um, significant number of plants worldwide um, uh, and even in North America and, uh, and wastewater specifically in North America, um, lots and lots of facilities over lots and lots of years, um, very, uh, very well proven uh, track record in, in municipal wastewater. Um, our regional presence, um, we do both drinking water and wastewater uh, plants, so the number of treatment plants, both drinking water and wastewater in BC, greater than 35. Uh, the number of wastewater treatment plants in BC uh, is 20, or greater than 20. Uh, and the number of municipal wastewater treatment plants on Vancouver Island uh, is, is eight. Um, points of significance, um, we're currently uh, involved with the city of Nanaimo's drinking water plant, significant size facility, um, membrane-based technology, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about membranes in a little bit, but, uh, but very similar technology to what we have in mind uh, for West Side, uh, used for drinking water, but, but same concept. Um, a cool little story about Thetis Trailer Park, uh, 10 minutes away from here. Uh, this facility is probably, I can't say it for sure, but it's probably the oldest MBR in North America, membrane bioreactor in North America, uh, almost 20 years old, um, and still on their original membranes, which is uh, which is probably doable when you're a trailer park, but uh, but still, uh, that's quite a that's quite a story all in itself to be able to have 20 years worth of life out of out of a piece of equipment like that. Um, and many of the facilities we have here uh, on the island are uh, in excess of seven years old. Um, I wanted to, before we actually get into, into the rest of the presentation, I kind of wanted to, um, to start with an interesting story. Uh, so this is Hendriksdal, which is right outside of Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, and this is probably the coolest plant that I've seen in the last 
12 months and I see quite a few. But this is what happens when you're in a country that is made up mainly of valleys and mountains and all the valleys are full of people. You end up building wastewater treatment plants inside of mountains. So this is a wastewater treatment plant tunneled and dynamited into a mountain. And it's really hard to see, but I mean, that's a man there, obviously. So these, these tanks are really, really deep. Yeah. So uh, the other reason I bring this story up is not only is that kind of cool um, to look at, but it's also uh, the world's largest MBR plant, 600 million litres a day. Um, and we've only just started sort of engineering that plant. It'll probably come online um, probably late 2018, early 2019, something like that. But, um, but definitely a, a very cool plant. Uh, when you look at photos like that. Okay, back to Westside and concepts and ideas of importance. Um, and here's really what I think I would look for uh, if I was a decision maker in Westside. Um, the ideas of most importance, effluent quality, community presence, O&M costs and sustainability, uh, robust and proven technologies, and expandable to match growth. Um, those, are, those are all pretty much the most important things I think I would look for if I was building a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and the full effluent quality, is that going in or going out? Coming out. Yep. Yep. The so stuff coming in is important, but you're really going to get measured on, on the stuff coming out. So effluent quality, um, technologies which ensure a high quality of treatment consistently. Uh, enables the ability to reuse effluent uh, and provides future protection against regulatory change. So we're looking at setting the bar a little bit higher, or at least uh, at least as high as we think we need to to make the 20-year horizon uh, or whatever the design life's going to be for the plant. Um, the picture there, you can see um, three glasses. Uh, this is a Corona a wastewater treatment plant in California. That's why the the day looks so beautiful behind the glasses there. Um, and on the right-hand side is the influent. In the middle is, uh, is the activated sludge, which helps treat the wastewater. And on the left-hand side is uh, the treated water. Uh, it's a water reuse plant. And if you're going to be doing water reuse, that's kind of what you want your water to look like for water reuse purposes. So that's effluent quality. Community presence, what do we want to look for? Uh, technologies that minimise footprint required and maximise the ability to hide. Um, o and costs, minimise labour and enable resource recovery to help offset energy and make biosolids, uh, make use of the biosolids or make use of the waste streams generated out of the treatment process. So normally the two largest um, operating costs within the wastewater treatment plant are the labour required to run the plant and the power required to run the plant. Um, and while it's good to try and minimise the operations and maintenance costs related to those, there comes a point where you almost can't minimise them any further without being detrimental to the process or, or having to trade off some of the other things that you might want. So what we're seeing is there are, uh, there's a greater movement within the industry to saying we'll try and reduce as much as possible, but once we think we hit the limit of where we can't reduce anymore, let's try to get some resources back out of the plant so that we can offset it. So we're not reducing, but we're, we're taking it from somewhere else and we're helping to offset the power that we're using. Expandable technologies. Um, you know, the, the previous presentation talked a little bit about having technologies that can provide cost-effective treatment day one, but uh, are easily expandable to uh, the end of life or, or the 20-year uh, period that you're looking at building the plant for. And they have to be expandable in increments that are not only easily addable to the process, uh, but also increments that can really help match your growth. You know, it's, it's no good having a, a plant that is designed for 20 years and saying it's expandable when there's really only one expansion and it's at year 15, right? You've poured all your cost in to make a plant that's going to last for 15 years. Um, you really want to be able to have increments that are smaller in nature but easily, easily able to be uh, executed so they can expand the capacity of the plant. Okay, 
So that's good. That's all what Rob Hacking thinks you guys should look for in your wastewater treatment plant. Let's actually look at some technology that might get us there. Um, so we're going to look at three technologies today, uh, which when combined together we think uh, provide you uh, a pretty good uh, solution that delivers all of those goals we talked about. Uh, primary treatment, we're going to talk about a technology called LEAP Primary. For secondary treatment, we're going to talk about MBRs or membrane bioreactors. And for solids treatment, we're going to talk about advanced anaerobic digestion. So um, before we talk about LEAP Primary, we should try and discuss a little bit about um, why do we want primary treatment. Um, so the two, the two big reasons for primary treatment, one, it provides us an ability to, to have resource recovery as a part of the plant. So we're taking uh, TSS and BOD out of the raw water, and with that uh, waste stream, uh, we should be able to generate energy from that waste stream and offset some of the energy in the plant. So resource recovery, we're able to take sludge out of the, out of the raw water and use it to try and offset some of the operating costs of the plant. And then the other reason is directly tied to energy savings itself, because we are taking uh, the total suspended solids and the BOD out of the water, uh, we're going to be reducing the amount of organic load that wastewater treatment plant has to treat. Um, and uh, you know, certainly on a plant the size that Westside is looking at in 20 years' time, um, that's going to be uh, a very sustainable approach and, uh, and should deliver a payback in terms of return on investment. So we think we need primary treatment. What is LEAP primary? Um, so in a typical primary treatment system, it would look something like coarse screening, fine screening, primary clarification, and then a bioreactor system. Um, with LEAP primary, what we've done is we've said, okay, we still need the coarse screening there. That's going to remove all of the large debris, um, six millimeters and larger, typically. Um, but the LEAP primary system itself is going to combine uh, the functions of the fine screen and the primary clarifier into one step. And then we have the bioreactor after that. And really this is how it does it. Uh, we're talking about a, a fine screen that performs the same function as a primary clarifier. So we have raw wastewater that is going to enter the screen and you can see there, there's a belt that goes around and on this belt, there's a very fine mesh, and that mesh is going to build a mat as the, waste, as the raw wastewater processes through the belt. And as that mat develops, we're going to start removing more and more TSS and more and more BOD. And that's going to, uh, that's going to be the function that enables us to act like a primary clarifier. We're going to start removing BOD and TSS out of that water, and then the water is going to continue on its path through the downstream side of the belt, and then out into the uh, out into the bioreactors. So we're performing the two functions I mentioned before: a fine screening uh, benefit with the performance of a primary clarifier. If you if you look at most wastewater treatment plants, um, primary clarifiers are used once you get above a certain size. Um, the land requirement and the the uh, the uh, operational requirement to run the primary clarifier becomes cost effective once you get to a certain size of wastewater treatment plant. Unfortunately, when you're down at smaller flows, like what Westside would be in the first, say, 10 years of their uh, operation, you don't see primary clarifiers used quite as much on plants of that scale. So what we hope is that by having a technology like this that combines a screening technology with a primary clarifier technology is that we can start using it on uh, plants that are um, you know, might have been too small to have had primary clarification considered initially so that uh, they get the advantages of primary clarification from day one and then by the time they get up into year 20, um, they already have it there in place. Uh, the other thing that you could imagine is that, so these are the, uh, these are the elite primary screens here. These are the cool screens here. The other thing that you can imagine is that being a mechanical device, um, they're uh, much more modular than building large concrete structures. So uh, we can install two initially, and then when the flows start increasing, or we find we need to add more, 
as long as we have the floor space for it and the, the structures have all been designed to accept it, we can add another one when we need. So modular and an ability to combine fine screening with primary clarification um, gets us uh, an advanced primary uh, system that's going to enable resource recovery um, and energy savings. Do you have any examples of the working, any working systems? Uh, there's, there's seven or eight on the island. Um, so what are, is the population there compared to here? They're small. They're definitely smaller. Uh, they're smaller communities on on the island for sure. So, um, if I just sorry, sure. Um, this is not. Oh no, it is. And just uh, so people online can hear the questions as well. If you have a question, if you could ask for the microphone, that would be great. Because other than that, it comes out of context. So this is really what we're getting at: elite primary uh, energy savings. Um, we think there'll be capital uh, cost savings there uh, with the combination of fine screening and primary clarification uh, occurring in the same process step. Obviously, it simplifies design. Um, we get uh, an ability to remove an awful lot of debris uh, from the bioreactors. So um, equipment and systems that are operating downstream of these uh, screening processes should be very well protected. Um, to give you a feeling for it, the, the, uh, the micron size on the mesh can be as small as, as 320 microns. Uh, so that's a, that's a significant amount of protection for downstream equipment that would otherwise have to deal with debris and, and solids occurring in the bioreactors. Um, and obviously a smaller footprint, right, whenever we're taking uh, large concrete uh, primary clarifiers and doing it with a, a screening mechanism, we should really be down into a smaller footprint than, than having clarifiers and a fine screening system as well. Secondary treatment, and really it's, it's tertiary treatment. Um, so with MBR, um, why do we want MBR? Uh, here are the most traditional drivers and, and benefits for MBR. Uh, footprint, um, very uh, compact technology. Um, you can see there an aerial photograph of a plant in Brescia, Italy um, from 1998. A little old now, but, uh, but uh, still one of our, our proudest plants. And this plant uh, had very little space to expand. Uh, the community basically could not build outside of this line here, and, or this line here, or this line here. So they were really boxed in. They have another bioreactor over here, and then one here. So really they wanted to fit something in this space here. The problem was they had 11 MGD to treat and their existing line, which took up almost exactly the same footprint, was treating 6.3. So they knew they had to do something different than what they were doing uh, in 1998 previous to that. Um, so yeah, good, a really good illustration, I think, of uh, the compactness of MBR. Um, quality and reliability, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the membranes and how they provide that. Um, but nevertheless, the effluent quality is very high and uh, the reusability, the reuse water capability there is, is present almost whether you like it or not. Um, aesthetics uh, sort of comes with having smaller tanks. Um, we're able to hide things uh, much more easy, much more easier. Um, and without those secondary clarifiers there, um, you know, again, that reduces the footprint and makes things easier to hide as well. Construction costs. Um, certainly in places where you have, um, uh, you know, excavation conditions that might require blasting or, uh, or costly excavation conditions or places where uh, concrete uh, is expensive, um, those are places where we see MBR become uh, very cost competitive. Um, modular design, obviously uh, by being able to add modules and, and membranes into the MBR system, uh, we're able to expand and, uh, and increase the capacity to, to deal with more flow. And we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more about this technology um, over the next few slides. So what forms a, a membrane bioreactor? Uh, we're talking about a, uh, an activated sludge system, completely mixed, suspended activated sludge system, uh, coupled with uh, a membrane uh, separation uh, process. Uh, in this case, it's submerged membranes for, for GE. Um, and then the ancillary equipment required to be able to run the membrane system. 
uh, a membrane. Uh, really, this is a, a, a permeable um, material that's going to allow some things through and reject others. And in this case, um, we're going to reject almost all solids, and all of the water is going to go through, uh, through the membrane material. Just so you know, this here is a uh, this here is a cryptosporidium cyst. So it doesn't really apply in wastewater so much, but in drinking water, these are the these are the things here that really create a lot of problems in drinking water distribution systems. And the material that it's sitting on is the membrane surface. So you can see why why membranes provide such safe, secure water. The the risk of that going through those tiny pores there becomes quite low. Impossible, almost, you would say. So, um, we make uh, membrane fibers. Um, that's sort of part of the, the magic uh, of this technology. And this is one here. So this is a, a hollow fiber ultra filter. Uh, so they're, they're called hollow fiber because they're hollow in the middle. Um, and really the secret to this technology is how do you make something that's really strong and durable, but really porous and permeable. How do you get a lot of water to go through it, still reject all the solids, but make it really strong? Um, so that's really, really part of the, the technology and part of the, uh, the science behind it all. Um, so we take these fibers, and you can see there in the, in the diagram, the water goes through, through the fiber, through the holes in the, in the fiber. You imagine for every inch along here, a billion pores, microscopic in size. Water is going to go th through those pores into the inside of the hollow fiber, and then we're going to pot those hollow fibers in modules. This is the module, so the fibers are going to be potted in the bottom and in the top, and then we're going to uh, form a cassette around those modules, and those modules are going to slide into that cassette, and they're going to have uh, guide rails all along the bottom and all along the top, and then we're going to have headers which are going to collect the clean water that we treat. And those headers are going to connect the cassettes all together in a train and go down to the pump. And the pump is going to draw the water through the hollow fibers. So all the solids in your wastewater are going to stay in the tank and only clean water is going to leave through the pump. And that's why MBR gives you such good water quality. Speaking of water quality, um, so we use MBR, I mean it's, it's been around for a while now as you can see there are lots of plants all over the world, uh, it's had to meet all sorts of regulations, uh, one of the most uh, prominent here especially if you're talking reuse is probably this one, um, but even if you're not talking reuse, even if you're just talking discharge quality, um, you know, we, we see these numbers here pretty readily achievable. So. Total nitrogen less than 5, total phosphorus less than uh, 0.15. I mean, we would see those numbers, that level of nutrient removal, uh, be required from plants that were discharging into, say, sensitive surface waters, uh, pristine lakes maybe, uh, or certainly any kind of um, uh, sensitive marine catchment. Um, Chesapeake Bay currently uses standards not too far off that because of their, uh, their seafood fisheries and the problems with that uh, marine environment not having a great deal of turnover and having quite a lot of eutrophication occurring. Um, you can see there turbidity, um, very low, and you can kind of see it even when you just look in the glass here, very low turbidity. A high UVT, um, so the, if, if you're doing disinfection and you want to put UV uh, systems on the back end, uh, we're going to have a very high uh, UVT or, or UV transmissivity, so the ability of light to be able to move through that liquid and disinfect on its way through. Uh, this number here is quite high. And one of the things that we've found um, when we go and survey our plants is uh, many of the plants that started with UV and, and were originally running them have now turned them off. When they continue to do uh, bacteriological testing for coli or uh, fecal coliforms or total coliforms, uh, the numbers were not any different once you got through the membrane, the water was, was already disinfected to a high degree. So they turn the UV lamps on now only really when they think they need to, which is a really good indication that we're doing quite a good job of disinfecting the water through the membranes. 
expandable. I think now that you, you can all see how we put together, yeah, you can pass it around, Devlin, thanks. Um, I think you can all see now that, we, that you know how we put membrane systems together with adding modules into cassettes and adding cassettes to form trains. And in this system here, you can see this plant here, these are all membrane trains here. Um, so we have multiple ways of being able to expand in a modular way. We could add cassettes into trains and we could add trains into the plant. So we're able to upgrade and expand in, in, very, uh, in very small increments. On the last page, um, I think the general public would be interested in knowing what your effluent quality is in relation to the discharge that already is discharging uh, into the soil water now. Discharge from? The end of the sewer outlet. Yeah, I mean, maybe somebody from the communities could better answer that than me, but I would imagine most ocean outfalls in Canada are probably around the 45-45 or 25-25 quality. Um, I could be wrong there for, for these communities, but um, and those numbers are really related to um, BOD and TSS. Yes, but what I'm saying is that if the general public can turn around and, and see that the MBR system mm -hmm. is, say, 300 or 1,000 percent better, mm -hmm. then that would cut down on the talk of, well, what are we gaining? Mm -hmm. And that by going to a million dollar or a billion dollar system. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think the numbers here are, are, are log different than, than what's probably going into the sea at the moment. So, um, so yeah, and certainly these numbers here, um, you know, there'll be new parameters that probably aren't even monitored at the moment in the, in the outfalls themselves. Okay, so yeah, I think I covered expandability. We have a technology here that's, that's modular in nature and very, very easy to expand um, uh, as the flows go up. Community presence, um, so ability to hide a beautiful house. Um, this is not a house, this is a wastewater treatment plant uh, in a community uh, that was built by somebody who needed to hide this house in the community. Um, so you can kind of see here, this door does not look normal for a uh, residential house, and inside there is pretty much just all process equipment and, and bioreactor tanks. Um, same thing here, uh, in a little bit more of a rural setting. Um, you know, this looks like a beautiful farm. Uh, this is actually a, a 20 MLD uh, wastewater treatment plant made to look like uh, a barn that fits in the, uh, in the rural setting there. Okay, solids treatment. Um, so, advanced digestion. Why do we want advanced digestion? Um, in the digestion of the wastewater, we're gonna create waste streams. Um, we talked about wanting to have primary treatment there. Primary treatment creates primary sludge. Um, we have uh, a, a tertiary or secondary um, process there that's gonna generate sludge as we degrade wastewater. Um, so we want to be able to treat those waste streams and ensure that we can dispose of them um, in, uh, in probably more than one location. Um, we also have this idea of uh, resource recovery, uh, being able to take those waste streams uh, and try to generate biogas for energy recovery. So that, that's, uh, those are really the two or three uh, major reasons why we want advanced digestion on site. So advanced digestion, um, in this case it's anaerobic digestion and we're converting the organics to methane gas and valuable byproducts. Um, and the waste streams we actually have or can accept three of them. So primary waste, this is from our primary process, um, from the primary, uh, primary clarifiers or elite primary in this case. Uh, the biosolids, so this is the waste that we generate from the treatment process itself. And then organic waste. So this is wastes from waste streams like, um, like organics, right? We, we know there's big movement in terms of trying to move organic wastes away from landfills. Um, we can use this digestion process to accept wastes from other waste streams. So supermarket wastes, um, any food and beverage, any kind of, uh, 
any kind of uh, business that's generating organic wastes, we can use this wastewater treatment plant to accept those streams, provide that user with a way to, um, to get rid of the waste that they're generating, and also help us create either electricity or gas. So the biogas that we generate here can either be used by engines to create energy, to create electricity, or it can be compressed for CNG. Uh, and this here really is all about the, the solids itself, right? So we're treating the solids so that they can be land applied uh, in a safe manner and we can use that nutrient content that we have there, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, and try to uh, condition soil and condition land so that we're, we're using what is essentially a waste stream as, as a fertilizer. There are a few different types of processes that, that, can, uh, that can achieve this now, but anaerobic digestion is by far and away the most proven. Um, there are um, an enormous number of, of anaerobic digestion plants that are able to do this now, especially over in Europe and, uh, and particularly in the UK. Uh, the UK, um, seven years ago, banned the disposal of organics into landfills. And since that time, uh, anaerobic digestion has popped up pretty much everywhere. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about a case study from the UK in a, in a little bit. Um, this is a really quick schematic of, of advanced anaerobic digestion. Um, so these are, these are all um, anaerobic digestion vessels. Um, you know, you might end up with this many. It, it might change depending on actually how much waste we're generating. But ultimately, we're conditioning the sludge and the waste and we're digesting it, and when we're digesting it, we're reducing the amount of the content of the sludge, and we're reducing biogas, and the biogas comes down here and goes into uh, this box here called CHP, or Combined Heat and Power Engines. These are engines that generate electricity, but they also generate um, hot water, um, or, uh, or even potentially, um, if there's a boiler connected to the system, they can generate steam, and then we can use that heat in the process to help make it more efficient, and we can also use that waste heat for district heating, uh, or we can use the electricity to offset the power we're using in the wastewater plant, or we can compress the gas to form CNG. This slide here uh, has a lot of uh, technical, technical terminology along here, but ultimately what it really means is with advanced anaerobic digestion, we've got smaller reactors, um, and with those smaller reactors, we usually have an ability to incorporate other waste streams. We have high quality biogas with a high yield. So a yield is how much biogas can you make off uh, a kilogram of COD or, or, uh, or you know, a kilogram of raw waste that you're bringing into the plant. Um, and the bottom line, an end sludge product that would be suitable for land application. Okay. So if we take those three technologies, LEAP Primary, LEAP MBR, and Advanced Anaerobic Digestion, and we were to use them in a wastewater treatment plant, we would get a wastewater treatment plant that produces high quality effluent with future protection and water reuse capabilities, treats its own waste streams with the possibility of treating waste streams from, uh, from other uh, communities or other sources, um, is compact and can fit into the community and can be energy neutral or even energy positive. Um, I'll go through the MBR um, case studies first. Um, Dockside Green, obviously a local, uh, a local water reuse uh, and, and also a plant that had to deal with some aesthetics where it was located. Um, a, a developer community um, wanted to be able to reuse the water in their community. Um, our MBR has been in place since 2007 there. Um, small flows compared to what cities and towns and communities like you all are, are having to deal with. But nevertheless, um, the same concept applies. Um, and you can kind of see here this, this piece of equipment here. Um, you know, it, here we have a control system with permeate pumps mounted on a skid and the membranes are gonna be uh, below the concrete floor there. So there you have a, a wastewater plant that's uh, treating uh, wastewater from a, a developer community, using it for reuse water, uh, discharging it to a somewhat sensitive environmental area there, um, and has, has done a pretty good job of, of remaining hidden in the, in the community. 
Harrison Hot Springs, local wastewater treatment plant, um, decided they needed to upgrade their uh, wastewater treatment plant. They currently use MBR today. Um, again, smaller flows than what uh, the combined communities of Westside are, are looking at, uh, but nevertheless, you can see the performance there. Um, pretty good, pretty good performance, really, from um, uh, from the technology. Excuse me, I hate to keep uh, taking over right. this mic, but Dockside Green was uh, turned around and built specifically for these purposes involved. The normal housing within the different municipalities don't have that. So therefore, yeah. uh, in order to start building houses and that, that are going to be able to uh, separate the uh, regular sewage yeah. and divide that in so that you can use that in treatment is going to be a huge, huge cost. And uh, I don't know whether the general public realizes the tremendous cost that's going to be involved with that. Mm -hmm. And, that, and the, not only would it be a huge cost to install it, but to maintain it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, the reason when you look around communities almost anywhere in Canada, there are very few that have um, twin piping systems in their house. And that's exactly the reason why. Um, I don't think that's an idea that necessarily needs to come to fruition here. If the community really wants it, they, they would need to know what that cost incurrence is going to be. Um, I think the, the, the trick to, to uh, being able to use reuse water is to be able to find um, the most applicable um, places to be able to reuse water. Um, golf courses, um, we're doing uh, a few communities in Alberta and Saskatchewan at the moment that are providing reuse water to power plants. Um, they're, they're, they don't, they're not lucky enough to have the source of power that, that BC is and in many cases. Most of them are either coal or, or fossil fuel driven. They have enormous uh, water requirements. Um, but yeah, certainly, water reuse, um, it's a great sustainability idea. It's got to be affordable to the community, um, and it's got to go where it's needed the most. There's no point trying to reuse uh, 10,000 uh, cubic metres of water a day when the golf course right next door is using 1 million litres of water a day. Um, you know, you've got you to be sensible about it too. So, yeah. So I'm just cognizant of the time as we move forward so that we can get through the presentation. And I'm sure other people have questions as well. Yeah. I know Michael's dying to answer the last <laughs> one that was just posed, <laughs> and we'll give him a chance at the end. Yeah. But uh, just to give everybody an opportunity to be able to participate in the conversation would be great. Thank you. Sure, and I'll, I'll hurry up with the last of the uh, case studies here. Um, Brightwater, big MBR plant um, over in uh, Seattle, Washington there. Um, you know, 117 uh, million litres a day um, has been up and running for a number of years now. Um, great plant to go and visit. Um, and uh, yeah, that was part of a, a very large infrastructure project, um, but nevertheless a good demonstration of technology. Um, I did really want the folks on this, uh, on this session to really pay careful attention to this case study. This is Avonmouth, uh, just outside of Bristol in the UK here. And uh, this is about creating energy positive wastewater treatment plants. Um, we don't need to know all of this stuff, but you know, ultimately this plant is an SBR plant, um, not a particularly efficient one. Uh, and they have lots of anaerobic digestion technology down here. Um, let's get through some of this stuff. So in 2007, uh, their anaerobic digestion process was processing 23,000 tonnes of dry solids per day, um, sorry, per year, uh, in this much volume of digester volume, and they were producing 1.9 megawatts. The wastewater treatment plant used 4.2 or 4.3 megawatts, so they were energy negative by quite a long way. Uh, after a number of upgrades, um, they really improved the amount of, so we were, we were adding advanced anaerobic digestion technology into this facility. And by doing so, we were able to take their production capacity up to 36,000 tonnes of dry solids per year. Um, not much more digester volume, but look at the power generation now. Four megawatts. Now you're, in, now you're energy neutral. Your wastewater plant does not cost the community any power. In 2012, what also happened was local, uh, the, the entity that was responsible for trucking the organic waste from the community 
approached GE and said, I want to be able to deliver my waste to this anaerobic digestion plant. Can you build me a system that will process that waste and deliver it into the anaerobic digestion system? And of course the answer is yes, we can. Um, so we needed some more volume here. We increased the throughput again, and now this plant generates 5.75 megawatts of power, and the wastewater plant uses 4.2. Now you're energy positive. So, the bottom line down here, you know, 10,000 10, homes equivalent of power, energy positive wastewater treatment plant, 1.8 megawatts going to the grid, 40,000 tonnes per annum of organic waste diverted from landfill. That's a good idea. I included these so that people can click on them in their own time. And that's it. Questions? Could you, hello, could you comment on um, your filtration system at the back end, putting on um, a UV plus peroxide process to further enhance the quality of the water? And what are the cost implications to that? Um, that'd be an unusual design for us. Do you, the peroxide, do you think, would be doing what? Advanced oxidation? It would, it would be cleaning, getting rid of those little prions and other organisms that pass through the um, membrane filter. Okay. Getting rid of the, or or <clears throat> eliminating to a greater degree the water-soluble uh, nasties. And, and basically, as an alternative to chlorine, peroxide basically is a substitute to yeah. chlorine. Chlorine's good. Sorry. So I just want to remind people, we really need to use the microphones because we've got a lot of people sure. online who, who want to participate as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, the UV, obviously, we're going to get some additional dis disinfection requirement there. Um, if you were going to reuse or you thought you needed a residual um, disinfection capability, you could use peroxide, you could use chlorine. Um, one thing I will say, and it was related to a question that was... Uh, that was asked uh, earlier on in one of the sessions. Um, one, of the, one of the encouraging things we've seen with this technology is a, a very high ability to remove uh, contaminants of emerging concern. So these are things like endocrine disruptors, these are things like uh, various hormones, you know, that unfortunately the, the group of chemicals in that family is enormous and part of the challenge for regulators is actually trying to define which ones they actually want to remove. Um, but for communities that had concerns around uh, contaminants of emerging concern, and Alberta is in this position right now, um, the best technology combination that we've found is actually adding powdered activated carbon in front of the membranes. And as an absorption technology that's doing, in Switzerland at the moment, we're, we're halfway through uh, some, some really interesting trials and we're, we're getting some good results on, on the combination of those two technologies and trying to remove lots of funky little chemicals that are still in wastewater after our after our process is done. Um. Uh, there was some discussion earlier about uh, reuse of wastewater, mm. and um, <clears throat> just wanted to see if you'd agree that uh, in areas where you've got a lot of uh, redevelopment, rebuilding from the ground up, okay. uh, that is an area where you could reuse water because you can. Uh, pipe, double yep. pipe from the beginning. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We we do. We have uh, California at the moment is in crisis when it comes to water use, and the number of developments down there that are almost being mandated to do dual plumbing and purple pipe uh, type scenarios is uh, they're they're everywhere. Mm. Everywhere. Yeah. We can also uh, um, use it for aquifer recharge. Yep. Uh, where that um, is beneficial to streams by indirect recharging of the stream through the aquifer so you get more filtration. Absolutely, yep. One, one more question. Um, the uh, Does this plant need 24-hour presence of uh, people? No, I mean, yeah, um, always a little challenging for vendors to, to answer that question, but um, there's, there's a pretty high level of automation um, on those plants. Um, there's a PLC that's running uh, the plant itself. Um, so we want, we want operators to be able to go in and make sure the pumps are turning, the blowers are moving, the instrumentation is calibrated correctly, 
that if there are alarms generated that they get dealt with uh, in whatever time duration that, that it requires. Um, but otherwise, you know, um, those, are the, those, are the, those are the real things that the operator needs to, to focus on. Um, otherwise, he's going to be sitting in a, in a control room. You know, one of the things I will say is um, we have clients who run MBR plants side by side with conventional plants. For whatever reason, at one point in time, they chose conventional, and then for whatever reason, um, another point in time, they chose uh, membrane bioreactor plants. And the staffing between the two changes a little bit. In conventional plants, we find um, people want uh, folks looking after those plants who have a pretty good knowledge of the biological um, system, uh, making sure the sludge settles in the clarifier. If it's not settling in the clarifier, knowing what uh, levers and, and buttons to push to be able to make it try and settle in the clarifier. With membranes, we don't have to worry about that so much. The membrane's going to keep all the solids in the tank. Whatever's going to grow in the tank is more or less going to grow in the tank. What we want are people who know how to keep instrumentation running properly, um, blowers turning, their mechanic. So yeah, the, the owners would, would move some of their skill set from biological expertise into um, technical expertise, uh, mechanical and electrical um, trades. Um, yeah, that's, so yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think there's, there's not a requirement to run it for 24 hours. Um, but, but the skill set would change a little bit between that technology and others. Uh, two quick questions. Um, I'm very interested in resource recovery. I, uh, I think that's uh, the wave of the future here. Uh, when you were talking about uh, fertilizers, mm -hmm. um, are you talking about uh, producing a fertilizer or a soil conditioner? Um, yeah, good question. In some ways, you've got to be careful how you answer it. Um, it, it will depend on, uh, so the, the, the sludge will have a certain nitrogen and phosphorus content. Whether it classifies as um, just a conditioner or whether it actually makes the threshold and could get classified as a fertiliser, I'm not too sure. What I do know in Canada is that we have a few issues because if you try to sell that product, uh, you get uh, monitored by a different regulation than just land disposal of sludge. So even though you might make a fertiliser quality, uh, there are costs incurred with, with, uh, with selling fertiliser, sorry, with selling that product, because now you do get classified as a fertiliser by the federal government, and you need labels and a permit, and uh, there are other costs, costs incurred. Yeah, obviously, uh, obviously a big difference in, in what kind of money you could recover from it. Yeah. Okay, my second question has to do with... Uh, uh, our situation here, and I assume that you have a reasonable understanding of the volumes that we're talking about uh, in Western community. Yeah. Um, if we think in terms of, of uh, a number of sites as opposed to one site, mm -hmm. um, and if we think in terms of sites that are large enough to uh, generate enough power to run themselves, mm -hmm. um, First of all, do you see a number of sites as being a possibility? And secondly, if so, uh, how many sites could you see us uh, uh, creating um, here uh, so that we could use the resources like heat and so on in a variety of ways? Yeah, yeah, good question. And the, so the the first two technologies, Leap Primary and Leap MBR, I, I'm not too sure it matters how you split the total flow up into number of smaller plants, they're both pretty modular in terms of, um, in terms of their technology. I think, I think if you're looking at resource recovery and anaerobic digestion, it seems to me it would make sense to try and put that just on one of the sites. Um, there, is a, there is a size limit below which um, you know, it's going to struggle to pay for itself. And I mean, if you, look at, if you look at where people are able to try and turn anaerobic digestion into a business or into something that helps people recover costs of wastewater treatment, um, as much as it's great to be energy positive and that should be a goal, I think, you know, the, the taxpayers of the community um, don't really want to see their tax dollars going into paying power bills for wastewater treatment plants. They'd much rather than go into new hospitals or something that's of uh, more visible public benefit. Um, so it's not necessarily the power that pays for anaerobic digestion. In, in communities like Avonmouth and, and, uh, and almost every community in the UK that's having to deal with these issues of what do we do with the organics, it's really the tipping fee 
um, that you're providing for treating that waste that really is is really the money. Um, the you know the the positive of accepting that waste is that you can generate a boatload more power, and uh, and that's a really good sustainability goal for a wastewater treatment plant to be energy neutral or energy positive. But yeah, that would be my gut feel is that with the flows that you're talking about, um, we have a, we have another project that that had. Um, similar to, to what you're talking about, multiple anaerobic digestion sites, all treating waste-activated sludge uh, from wastewater plants. And what we're seeing is communities are closing those down and trying to build sludge super centres. So they would rather truck sludge uh, around uh, and into one common digestion process than try to run two, three or four of them. Try to get some scale so that you can actually get some efficiency and you have one group of operators who, who know how to run it. Kind of developing along that line, um, in this region, um, we are prohibited from dumping sludge onto, um, onto land. Okay. Um, now, and there's a, quite a number of us that are also against the idea of trucking it to somebody else's um, uh, territory. Uh, yeah. Um, there's just some moral. Yep. A, and. So some of us have been looking at the alternative um, to the um, biosolid, the sludge, uh, and that's gasifying it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that process, um, extracting more resources mm -hmm. than, um, and getting rid of incineration, which the um, other process um, would follow. Yep. Could you kind of elaborate or comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um I think you probably started with my, my, what my answer is going to be is depending on your preference of, of, of what fits with you and what sits with you well of what you want to do with this waste will, will probably dictate the process that you're, you're going to use. We have seen gasification uh, increase uh, typically in communities that are using gasification also for things like municipal solid waste or other um, waste streams that are in the community, um, just trying to either piggyback I mean, you can see the same pattern happen in, in so many communities now, right? How do, you, how do you take a problem from one department and a problem from another department and try and put them together so that you're not building completely separate facilities for, for what is almost the same problem? Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the options become uh, much more limited if you're not interested in doing land disposal and you're not interested in, in making it somebody else's problem or being, uh, being reliant on somebody else to take it from you. Uh, just for clarification on his point, uh, I just conferred with Michael here, uh, that prohibition is a CRD prohibition. Mm -hmm. If you go into uh, places like uh, Usoyus and Vernon and so on, uh, it's, they're applying this stuff to golf courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I will say one thing. I, I sat uh, with one of the gentlemen that's on the CCME Council for Biosales to Land application and the CCME Council are currently in the process of updating their uh, federal guideline for communities for uh, biosolids application. Um, so, um, you know, similar to wastewater in the past where there wasn't a lot of f sort of federal guidance on, on what pro provinces and, and, and municipalities can do uh, with wastewater, um, you know, that will be in draft form. Um, probably by the end of this year, it probably won't get accepted for another year after that because there's all these stakeholders that have to have uh, comment on it and, and, and modification to it. But there is quite a lot. Of, so when they, when they set the wastewater um, regulations in CCME and the federal government decided, all right, we're going to try and push people towards removing ammonia um, for fish toxicity reasons, uh, what they did by default was try and turn communities um, who might have used uh, different technologies in the past to ones that all of a sudden generate quite a lot of sludge. And so now you've got a biosolids problem. So right on the back of the wastewater effluent um, requirements, uh, you know, by default, you're going to have to do something with your biosolids. The gentleman before you that was on the screen there was saying that uh, medical wastes and industrial wastes like that had to be sort of separated and then uh, mixed and diluted into the water yeah. systems or away from their system anyway. 
Is that the same with your system? Could, or, and is your system able to uh, deal with all, like we have industrial, uh, hospitalization, mm -hmm. uh, care homes, everything here that uh, could probably deal with everything. So mm -hmm. does your system deal with all of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the number of plants that we have installed, I would suggest there's pretty good proof there to say that we can deal with um, you know, the streams that any community would typically de uh, develop or generate. Um, if the community is doing something different that, you know, the, the other 300 plants that we have in North America aren't, aren't doing, then we would have to be careful of that. Um, you know, medical waste is a speciality all on its own. It's really hard to answer the question in, in the time that we have. I would suggest if it's a general hospital, you probably don't have too many concerns. If it's somebody who's doing advanced radiology or there's things coming down the sewer line that we are not... Um, uh, predisposed to in our in our careers or in our profession, then we might have to go and learn what those things are and how our how our system handles it. Um, so there's a little bit of caution there. If, if if it's a general hospital, I think would be fine. If it's a specialty hospital that has um, you know very specialty things that are going down the drain, then yeah, I think maybe you got to take a bit of a closer look at it. But most of the time, when you're talking about community wastewater treatment plants like this, um, the wastewater has a certain characterization about it, and, and our technology is, is pretty good at, at knocking most of it out. So, so. Final questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, that was incredibly informative. Uh, parts that you missed, you can download online once it's posted. Uh, we're going to have another short break. They have replenished the coffee for those of you outside. Um, and we'll be starting up again at uh, 3.30 sharp with our last presenter today. And thank you again to GE for the presentation. Thank you.